All right, y'all. So, uh, yeah, like my dad said, this is the end of the, uh, or at least our preaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for y'all keeping score at home, uh, we started on March 6th, uh, and when we went through the Beatitudes, uh, and then we started the after the Beatitudes Sermon on the Mount on, uh, on May 15th. So I kind of looked back out of curiosity because I made a joke at uh, my dad about, I'm like, are we going to be on this for like the next next year or two? For those, I think like there's some people who have only been here for the Sermon on the Mount. We do preach on stuff other than the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but coming to the close here, Matthew 7, 21 through 29 is kind of where we're going to spend. Uh, that is the end of the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to look at. Uh, and the end of this, the, be- the greatest sermon ever given and at the very end of it, Jesus, Jesus kind of leaves us with a, with a call to action or almost like comparing the two, two groups of people, hearers and doers. Uh, and we're going to take a look at that. If I had to really, I don't know, title this sermon or something, it would build it on the rock, but really it's, it's into action here because he tells all this stuff that we could hear and it would go to waste unless we're going we're gonna to practice it and put it into action. So let's go ahead and uh, open up in some, pr- in some prayer before we get into the word. Dear Jesus, Lord, thank you for this time uh, together. Just pray that your word, Lord, just uh, Lord, just penetrates our hearts, our minds, Lord, that we would just, uh, we wouldn't hold any concerns or worries uh, that would prevent us from hearing you. God, I pray this time, that's what it is, Lord, just just your fullness, your goodness, Lord, that just works in our heart and our mind. Lord, I thank you for your sanctification, for the way that you're molding and just constantly forming our hearts and our minds and just help us, Lord, to believe the areas where we may not believe and to have greater faith, Lord, and just to, to practice, Lord, what you what you preach. Lord, thank you for your love, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so uh, starting on off, uh, anyone has anyone done the Presidential Physical Fitness Challenge before? Uh, do you all remember that? It stopped in 2013, so some of you all might not, uh, but it was a fitness test that like uh, you did in gym class growing up that consisted of like, sit, how far you could stretch, and like some jump activity, a uh, mile run or something like that, depending upon your age, and then push-ups was the last part. And uh, at my school, I grew up in a private school, uh, and at the end of the year, we had almost like an award ceremony. There's three tiers. There's the yellow, the red, the blue, and you get recognized at this award ceremony. If you're yellow, you get, you know, th- they might say your name, but no real special recognition. Most people were able to get the yellow. Uh, And the red was a little bit harder. You might stand up and they'd say your name. And then there was the top tier, the blue, the presidential of the Presidential Physical Fitness Award, where if you could do the top tier on all these metrics, you would get brought up the front of the ceremony or award service, whatever it was at the end of school, uh, end of the school year, and they would recognize you. And only a couple people per grade usually got this. It was pretty hard to to get this. Um, So I got the red tier one year. And I, the next year, I remember uh, that I, I was determined to get the blue tier. That's what I wanted. There's this kid, Phil. Uh, uh, I don't know if I, this is last year. Phil Spamini, if you're watching this, what's going on, man? Uh, who, uh, <laughs> who, he was like, he could do like, like 50 push-ups. In my mind, it was like he came out of the womb just with muscle on him, right? And we're like fifth, sixth grade. Uh, and I couldn't do many push-ups. And that was the one part that was stopping me from the presidential tier, the, the blue tier. Because I got the red, couldn't get the blue. Uh, and I remember talking to, talking to uh, Phil about this. And I told him, I'm like, yeah, I can do 20 to 30 push-ups now. I'm going to be able to hit, I think the mark was 16 or 20, somewhere in that range. I'm like, I'm going to be able to do it this year. Um, and I told him that. That wasn't true. I could do like four. So the, uh, but I said that that is what I was going to do. Uh, and I remember the gym teacher told us what we had to do in order to hit that push-up mark if we wanted to. And I even remember a couple times in the bunk bed I had, there was a little wooden slat that held the, bu- uh, the bed above me, and I'd grab it and just kind of pull up on a few times before bed, and I'd be like, all right, we're good. I'm going to be able to get these push-ups done. Uh, so that went on for months, and we get to the Preschool Fitness Challenge, and I do the run, and got that time I need for the blue or whatever, V-sit, you know, and whatever it is, get the blue, all the other exercises. Then the push-ups come, and the way it worked was one person would have their fist on the ground, and your chin had to come down, touch the touch the uh, fist, and then back up, and that'd be one push-up. You had to do like 16. Uh, and when we got there, Phil was the person who had his his fist out for me and was going to count my push-ups. And I've been telling him that I could do 20 to 30 push-ups for like months now, uh, and it was wild when after the first push-up, it seemed like I was out of breath and shaky. 
Uh, and I think I got about eight, eight push-ups, right? Uh, so why am I talking about the President's Physical Fitness Challenge, uh, other than to maybe like uh, confess some lying I did when I was 11 years old? Uh, but this is what we're looking at at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, is there's all this great preaching and all this great uh, Jesus gives us, but unless we put any, to it, uh, any of it into practice, it's no good. It's as good as me saying, I can do 20 to 30 push-ups, right? I can do all this stuff, but unless we're going to take all of the teachings and put them into practice, we aren't going to be able to achieve. When that test comes, we aren't hitting that blue presidential tier. We're probably in the yellows or below, right? If we aren't practicing what God preached, we're going to be in a tough spot. Um, so the first uh, scripture that we're going to get into um, is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Uh, and this, man, this, this chunk of uh, scripture from 21 through 29 is, is a lot that we could get into. Um, but the 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. So Jesus, what he was doing here is partially exposing the people who sounded religious but had no personal relationship with him. Uh, and the powerful part of this verse is verse 23, the I never knew you. You know, and I, I was thinking about this when I was looking at this scripture. I was almost like, well, what's the modern equivalent of this? You know, present day when he wrote this, it's like, man, this is modern equivalent right here. Do you see people who f say they're preaching Jesus, but there's definitely ulterior motives behind it? Maybe like there's some pastor or preacher or something that there's some scandal that comes out that they used uh, God's house or, or God's name just for some sort of ulterior motive. Uh, and this is, w in, the, in the same way to that, as someone could go to an extreme of, of abusing God's name, uh, we could we can get trapped into almost the same type of uh, type of issue where all of a sudden we say because we sit in church on a Sunday that that we know Christ, or because we put a Facebook uh, a verse on Facebook that we know Christ, because we have a bumper sticker on the back of our car that we know Christ, and that's that's kind of the scary part here is like you look at James two nineteen says that even the demons know Jesus, they shudder. Like, we can know Jesus, but if we don't have a relationship with Christ, he's going to say, depart from me, you evil doer, I never knew you. And that's, that's the scary part here is sitting, sitting in church does not make us a Christian. The same way me talking about doing, being able to do push-ups for months did not make me able to do push-ups. If we aren't going to hear the words that God say and then put it into practice, there's no good to, uh, for any of it. So Romans 2.13 says, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And then we see a, a parable here that Jesus uses, which is the primary way Jesus communicated with us in a lot of the text. But um, we see him compare two groups again, the hearers and the doers. The people who are going to hear the word, might even talk about the word, and then people who are going to do it. So let's look at Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And as we go through this, just keep in mind, this is like the last bit that Jesus is talking on. The whole Sermon on Mount, this is what he comes to the end with. He, kind of this proposition of, all right, you're one of two groups of people. You're either the hearers or the doers, and here's what he says about them. Therefore, everyone who hears the word of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. We see here in Jewers, we see wise men and we see fools compared here, and that's what he leaves us with. Uh, so there's a word all throughout the New T uh, Testament, Greek word, uh, poieo, which it permeates the, the Sermon on the Mount, is all throughout it, and it's an action verb, to do, uh, to act or prepare, the same as uh, Jesus' brother James in James 1.22, says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. We're supposed to be doers, we're supposed to poieo these words, it's, it's nice to hear 
these words and listen to these words, uh, but unless we're putting them into action, they're, they're useless. It's almost like I know New Year's resolutions are always a big one where we, we have the best, man, I look at a 15-minute uh, routine to make your day the most productive possible or some other different step, weight loss, fitness, and you can read it and be all gung-ho about it. And all right, fantastic, but when it comes to the action of actually taking it, sometimes we, uh, we, we come a little bit short. And Jesus is, uh, the people that Jesus is telling this to is, uh, he knows his audience. This isn't written specifically for the disciples. It's the people who follow Jesus to hear this sermon. And he might even say that, you know, some people who might have, uh, feel like they have some brownie points just for following Jesus and going to hear him. He says, no, none of this, just hearing me isn't enough. What I need out of you is action uh, as well. He contrasts two type of people uh, and the, the Greek was fun. I got to, when we were up in Maine, I got to talk to my little brother who's currently taking a Greek course. Uh, and I was talking to him a little bit of what we were going through on this Sunday. And he gave me a little bit in, more insight. But the two words that he con, uh, contrasts here are phronimos, which is be wise, and then moros, which is to be a fool, which is kind of funny because I must have known some people who knew Greek because I feel like I heard moros a few times growing up. Uh, but moros being uh Fool and the Pronomos is almost like uh, my little brother told me it's almost the context of con- uh, context of being wise with the prudence to it of hearing something and then having the wisdom to know what to do with it, not just letting God's word go to waste, but actually applying it in our life. Having this Pronomos be wise uh, with what we're given. If we look back at verses 21 to 23, we can see people who might do good things. Like, we can do objectively good things, and I've seen this. I have some good friends in my life where it's sad. They have fallen away from the church, and their whole goal is just to do good things. They want to do objectively good things. They want to help out people who are poor. They want to help out uh, the sick and the needy and things like that, but the whole issue is this, apart from Christ, is worthless. We can say that we did a lot of good deeds. We helped out people. I mean, you know that people with, uh, people can donate millions of dollars, but that isn't enough to save them. And when we see what Christ is saying throughout all of this, unless you have a relationship with Christ, all of this is, all of it's to waste. There's no way into my kingdom unless I know you. And how beautiful of a thought that kind of is, that the, the whole thing he's getting at here is he wants to have a relationship with us. He says, you can do all this stuff, that's cool, you can donate money, you can help the sick, that's all right, but unless you know me, you aren't going to get into my kingdom. And that's the creator of this universe loves us so much that he wants to know us. That's the big part of all this, is he just wants to know us, and he wants us to draw close to him. There isn't some sort of veil that's up, it's torn. He wants us to be close for him. And there's this one uh, quote, uh, I I, I couldn't get who said, I lost who said it, uh, but I definitely know it was way too good to come from my own brain. Uh, And it was talking about sometimes we we learn and we hear, and we just want to learn and hear. We want to listen to these sermons, uh, and I, I'm guilty of this sometimes. Like, I'll just be driving. I'm like, you know, I just need to listen to another sermon or listen to some worship music, and I'm good, right? We, like, get it. It's almost like using Scripture and God as a Band-Aid to cover some sort of guilt we might have. Uh, and this quote was, Our issue isn't in teaching and learning, but obeying and embodying. Maybe we ought not spend so much time being concerned learning more until we spend time, uh, more time obeying what we already do. I was that one hit me a little bit. That one hit me a little bit. You know, it's, uh, I think, this is my third time preaching. I think I've mentioned C.S. Lewis in every single one, so I'm going to do it again. Uh, and he, there's uh, one of his books, he, I don't know the exact one, and he was talking about how sometimes we can be like, uh, he made this great illustration of almost like a, a seven-year-old who's wanting to clean his room. And he could clean his room, or he could, I might not be a C.S. Lewis but he's, there's a seven-year-old who wants to, who's going to clean his room. And all he has to do is clean his room, but instead he's going to research the best way to clean his room. And then he's going to get three to four of his friends, and they're going to have a study on how to clean your room, and they're going to get together and compare notes and journal about cleaning their room when all they got to do is clean their room. And sometimes I get trapped into this. Instead of just doing what God asked me to do, I love being a hearer. And I'll even be a talker, and I'll talk with other people all about it when all I have to do is do what God wants me to do. And too often I get trapped into just talking about it, and a lot of the time that's 
probably stemming from pride of just wanting to hear myself talk and act like when I know it all, when it com push comes to shove, the, a the actions aren't there. We have to practice it. We have to do it however we often find excuses. Um, and with the, the two builders we look here, they had a lot of similarities. Both of them heard Jesus. Both of them built something. And they both had terrible circumstances, right? But their outcomes were entirely different. Uh, what the trial ended up, they came through, we could call it a trial. A bunch of wind and storm and rain came through. And the trial kind of revealed who had a solid foundation. And how often in our lives, all of a sudden, we think we might do it all right. But all of a sudden, a trial comes and we might start straying away from God a little bit. We might try to take it into our own hands. And this is, this is if we're talking about practicing and doing, if we aren't going to get, if we aren't going to be able to work through these trials, that's, that's where, this real, where our real growth comes from. I remember I was super naive when I first really started digging into the Word. Uh, and I was like, I remember saying this. I think I said it to my mom or something. Like, man, I'm just ready for a big trial. I'm ready for one that comes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. Silly Caleb. Uh, but too often is we, we are all right in this little bubble where, we're, where we can think about it. But unless we are practicing, unless we're putting into work and our foundation is solid on Jesus Christ, when the trial comes, it's going to reveal the cracks in the house. If our foundation isn't on Jesus, all of a sudden when that wind storms, the wall is going to come toppling over. They both had a trial, and they both had uh, t wildly different outcomes. James 1, 2, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Um, and we can, we can build an eternal life that ends with Jesus only if it's built on Jesus. And uh, do our behaviors always indicate, do our behaviors indicate that our lives are built on this solid foundation? Are we taking, the, when the trials come, our behaviors, are we already set in place to where we have, uh, we're ready for when this storm is coming? Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Our foundation is built on Jesus. Love for, for those around us and love for God has to, has to show out in our lives. Um, looking at this scripture... If we have a foundation built on the relationship with Christ, it really, really doesn't matter how hard the winter storm. It doesn't, like it doesn't, Jesus didn't say that, oh, well, with 70 mile per hour winds, the, the, the building was, be able to, was able to uh, fall. And he didn't talk about the building materials that were used. All he's talking about is his love and Jesus Christ being enough no matter what the trial will come. No matter what storm comes, no matter what rain comes, we're going to be able to handle it all. Uh, his love is great and surpasses knowledge. It's wide and covers all of our experiences. It's longer than any of our lives. It's deeper than any despair or tragedy we're going to go through, and it's higher than any joy or celebration. It doesn't matter what we have in our lives if it's not built on Christ. There's no amount of money, job security, family around us that's going to be able to withstand a storm. And I just it's interesting how the foundation, all Jesus is talking about is you build the foundation on me and your house is going to stand. Your life is going to stand and it's going to be able to handle whatever comes. It didn't say you build on me and then put a good, good little monetary safety shield that's one wall and then make sure you have a perfect family life on the other wall and you'll be okay. Didn't talk about the materials that were used in the house. Didn't talk about the circumstances around this house. It said whatever comes, you are going to be okay as long as your uh, foundation is on me. Romans 8, 38 through 39, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ our Lord. We can withstand whatever, whatever storm is going to end up coming if with his love, and if that's what our foundation is built upon. We can hear about all this, we can talk about all this, but unless we are poeyers, I don't know the way to conjugate that verb, 
But unless we are taking action, we aren't going to be able to withstand the storm. Unless we're living a life that's wisdom rooted in Christ. And a lot of the time, uh, this, this isn't the easier route. And I know on Sundays, like I leave church, my best of intentions are Sunday about like, let's see, 12, 10 p.m. That is, that is when my intentions are the purest. I'm good, ready to go. This week's going to be the week. And then all of a sudden, Monday comes around, then Tuesday, then Wednesday, and then all of a sudden, maybe next week, or man, I didn't get to bed that early last night, and I have to do this and that. All of a sudden, we start making these excuses. And the, the kind of what was mentioned easy, or earlier in the Sermon on the Mount a few weeks ago was the talking about the narrow gate and the wide gate. It's not easier to build this house on his foundation. This isn't the easier way. This is through the narrow gate. And this house may end up costing more and being harder to build, but it's going to be better than any other house you're going to be able to get. It's going to be work, and we have to take action. It's, it's an action verb that we're told to take. It's not something that magically is going to happen. Uh, it's, there's going to be trials. There's going to be persecution. And I think back to early on, back in March, when we went through, uh, oh, this might have been April, Matthew 5.10, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Trials will come. That's going to happen. But we're going to be able to, to handle this. So Matthew 7, 28 through 29, the very end, the last of Sermon Mount. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Uh, the religious scholars of the time would often make references to other people uh, just to and quote important figures just to support their, their interpretations or their arguments or their teachings. Uh, but, but Jesus didn't have to do that. He spoke with his own authority. That's the only authority that he needed. Uh, and he didn't have to refer- represent, uh, reference anyone because he was, uh, he was the word. And when we look at this, when we look back, if you all think back to March, we remember that perfectly, right? Uh, all right, if some of y'all weren't here in March, you get a pass. But the, uh, we look back at this beginning of the scripture. To what degree do our lives represent the directions gave in, uh, Jesus gave in this sermon? Now, this is a lot. I mean, a lot of it we built, we changed our, our, the identity of our church was entrenched in the Sermon of the Mount, right? Salt and light. That's what we're called to be. And we look at all these, uh, talking about marriage, talking about, uh, talking about different ways to approach uh, confrontation with people looking at how we're supposed to interact with people uh, who aren't believers all throughout the Sermon on the Mount, to what degree do our lives represent the directions Jesus gave in this sum- sermon? And I feel like most people don't intentionally build their house on the sand. It's not like I leave here and I'm like, well, I'm going to mess some stuff up this week. I'm going to get, I'm going I'm to go ahead and start, start choosing, uh, choosing the enemy here. But a lot of the time, it's, it's often not out of obstinance, but out of thoughtlessness. It's we aren't being intentional with what we are doing. What about our daily lives our, uh, what about our practices that we put in place in our daily routine sets us up so that our lives, do, our lives do represent what Jesus said in this sermon? Do we stop and think where we're building? Do we stop and see where the cracks are from poor foundation? Or do we kind of just keep going along, being all right with whatever's happening? The beauty of this is that we can stop at any time and God's going to help us rebuild. God's plenty okay with that. He's, he's not going to say, well, you got, you got a tough house. You're going to have to wait a little bit uh, until you get a new one. And he doesn't want to just patch up that, those cracks that are starting to show. He wants to, he wants to build a whole new house with his foundation, not having to deal with the, the, the junk from other parts of our lives. When Jesus sends the sermon, he lays it all out. He says, here, are, here are my words. Are you going to follow them? Are you going to be hearers or doers? Uh, what practices are we going to place to make sure we, we not only hear but we do? How are we going to poeo? How are we going to take action and put into practice what we're doing. So that when the pre- presidential physical fitness test doesn't come up, you end up doing eight push-ups when you said you could do 20 to 30 the whole time. Do we merely, do we have time daily to hear and practice God's word? Not just hear God's word, but practice his word. Is it something that's permeating our lives and, and just consuming all of our interactions with o- others? Or are we just hearing? Do we hear and ignore it, or do we choose to build on a good foundation? And that's, that's the, the beauty of, of this every week as we get to come to communion, as we see how much God loves us, that, that Jesus died for us for our sins. That he said, while we were still sinners, 
while our foundation was already built on sand and we were, we were building something poor, he loved us so much that he died for us. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. He can rebuild and he can build whatever it is that we've actively ignored uh, because of his great love for us. He loves us so much that he wants to, he wants us to come in communion with him. That's just such a wild thought that the creator of this universe wants you. Jesus Christ wants you and he wants to know you. And the only th- thing that can stop us, we need repentance, which is why we come at communion, and we need faith. And we need to come together with those things just at the feet of Christ as Jesus wants to, wants to know us better. So... Sorry, this is my third time doing it. My transitions into communion aren't as smooth as I hope. But we have, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, at this time we get, to, we get to confess our sins to Christ. And he forgives a repentant heart. Repentant meaning a true turn. Not just to kind of feel bad, but there's a genuine desire. where We want to put things into practice in our life. where We, wanna, we want to change. We want to choose God in decisions where we might have been choosing ourselves. So let's go ahead pray together as we come into this time. Lord, thank you, God, that that we don't have to we don't have to build on our own, that we don't have to face trials on our own. Lord, that your love is so good and all encompassing that you want every aspect of our lives, God. Lord, thank you for your sure, strong foundation that we can build on. Just pray in this time, Lord, that we come before you confess the sins, the ones that we might not want to let go of, the ones that we've felt like we've failed at so many times that we feel just almost embarrassed to have to ask for forgiveness again. I pray that 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 isn't something, Lord, that we realize that's a tool of the enemy, God, that he wants, the enemy wants us to feel guilt and shame, and you just want us to come towards you, Lord, just at your feet. Lord, thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, for your love. God, I pray this time, Lord, that we just open our hearts to you, that we lay it all down at your feet, knowing you can handle it. Lord, we can't. I pray there isn't an issue in our lives that we don't put above you. There isn't something, Lord, that we're we're making bigger than you, that we aren't making idols of work or money or family, Lord, that we would just give it to you. Thank you for your love. Jesus.